And tonight, church, I want to read a verse of Scripture, some things in my heart I feel led to share with you tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, one verse of Scripture, verse 12, very familiar. I wish to stir up your pure minds by a way of remembrance. The Holy Ghost has just graced this place with His presence right here tonight. I just feel like I need to remind us of some things, maybe put a few things into perspective. Encourage us, I hope, challenge you for just a few moments here as the Lord would lead us. I appreciate the day, whatever you were able to fast today. appreciate those of you that were able to fast and pray. I appreciate a time, even presently in this service, just to wait in the presence of God and hear the voice of the Lord and listen to Him and talk to Him and praise Him. In the midst of the church, in the midst of the congregation of God's people. I thank the Lord for that. There's a few things that are just on my heart as a pastor in this church. And I just wish to share them with you. God's doing a lot of things. There's a lot of things changing and happening even in us. A lot of ministry that's changed in reference to this church. A lot that's going on. And uh, God's doing wonderful things and I thank Him for it. And I don't want to lose it in times like these. How about you? The Bible says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Would you say amen to God's Word? You may be seated for a little while here this evening. I want to just take some time. I want to share just a few things about my weekend and then some things that I want to share with you just it's on my heart but on my heart today in reference to where we are I want to say first of all tonight in reference to the scripture and what we've got in this church tonight we can lose it there is no guarantee or I should say there is no unconditional guarantee there's a guarantee but it's a conditional guarantee There is no unconditional guarantee that you and I can always come into this place and gather in this house as a body of saints and every time feel the Spirit of God and the liberty of the Holy Ghost as we feel in this place tonight. There are people sitting here tonight, many of you, I've been there, But many of you sitting on these pews here tonight were at one time in another church, a holiness church, a church where the Word of God was preached, a church where people lived right. And I could imagine that several years ago you would have thought it will always be this way. We will always be able to come and gather in the house of God. We're going to have holiness preached. We're going to hear holiness. We're going to live right. We're going to feel the power of God. We're going to continue to see sinners saved. And yet those churches today are not experiencing the power of God. They're not preaching the message of holiness. They are not experiencing the presence of the Spirit of God. And they have lost what they once had. Therefore, let a man, the man that thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. I'm telling you, there are many people tonight that are living in sin, that were once living in Christ. They were once Christians. They were once living it right. And I would imagine in their lives they thought it will always be this way. I'll always feel God. I'll always read my Bible. I'll always go to church. I'll always grow in Christ. I'll always feel the Spirit of God. But today they do not read their Bible. They do not pray. They do not feel God's Spirit. They are not where they used to be with Jesus Christ. Wherefore let a man think he stand, take heed lest he fall. I'm telling you that what you and I feel in this this place tonight, it is possible to lose it. I'm telling you what you feel in your soul right now tonight. It is possible to lose it. What are you doing to maintain your experience in Jesus Christ? How is your prayer life? How has your communion with the Master been this week? When's the last time you memorized a passage from the Scripture? When's the last time you took the Scripture, some portion, and committed it to memory in an effort to know more about your God? I'm telling you, wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed 
lest he fall. You can lose what you have. There is no unconditional guarantee that you and I will always feel what we feel in this place tonight. Which means there are some things that it behooves you and I that we need to do. That we need to dig in. That we need to make certain that we are taking heed and obeying God so that we are careful to maintain good works, the Bible says. So that we're careful to maintain what we have and not just maintain but I would like to see it intensify. I would like to not only see us hold what we have, but I'd like to gain new ground. Amen. I'm not just interested in hanging on. I'm interested in climbing higher for Jesus Christ. Glory. I don't want just you to climb higher as a minister and pastor. I want to climb higher in Jesus Christ. I stood in church last night in the Hispanic church, Brother Andres' church. I went. We had a service together yesterday evening. And I stood there as they were singing and it just began to overwhelm my soul. And I began to feel how many people are just kind of straggling along. How they're just kind of dangling. They're just kind of hanging in there. You know, they're coming to church, but they're not really on fire. They're not really digging in. They're just kind of easing along. And I, and I just thought, Bro, you know, how much people need to feel the power of God. And it just kind of come on and said, God, I want to walk close closer to you than I've ever walked before. I want to live nearer to God because I'm telling you, I want to affect somebody. I want them to get around me and feel the power and the presence of God. I want them to get in my presence and know that I've been in the Lord's presence, not because of Dan Woods, but I'm telling you, this generation needs to know what it's like to feel the power of Almighty God. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. You have no unconditional guarantee that you can keep what you have. There are conditions to keep what you have. I was talking. I spent this past weekend at Manchester, New Hampshire, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Two services, Saturday and Sunday. One service Friday night, five times, five services. I preached over this past weekend to a crowd as hungry as I've ever seen in the crowd. I don't know when I have ever seen a people so hungry and so receptive to the Word of God. Sunday night I preached. I preached every service under the Lord was gracious. I felt my weakness. There were many times I just went to the pulpit feeling my weakness asking God to help me. Sometimes I just had to wait. I didn't even know exactly which way to go, but God gave the message and poured it on. And those people were like, I don't know, they were just eating it up. And it wasn't something new. The pastor there told me, this is how they are. He said, they, I preach an hour and a half near about every service. And he said, they're hungry for more. And I thought about, here is a church that at one time had a pastor was doing really good. And no doubt they never thought they would lose what they had. But their pastor died and they went for eight years without a pastor. And they've just got one now. He's been there for not quite a year. And me going there was the first revival that that church has had, I suppose, in, in, in whatever, eight or nine years. And the first one since this pastor's been there. And things are starting to revive. And I'm sure many of those people thought that we'll never lose it. We've got it. Everything's going to continue on. Everything's going to be good. But they lost it. They went down to almost nothing. And the grace of God has come to revive them and rebuild the church and strengthen it. And I'm just telling you tonight, church, uh, that you can lose what you have. There is no unconditional guarantee that you can keep it. We need to appreciate it. We need to hunger for it. We need to thank God for it. And we need to dig it out and say, God, take us a notch higher and lift us up a little bit more. 
I ministered this past week quite a bit. The last night I was there, the Lord anointed in a mighty way. I was already somewhat tired, but the Lord just anointed and I preached for an hour and 40 minutes. And I, I don't know, I was just, I was ready to, I, I finally came to the place. I looked out to the people and I told them, I said, that's it. I have no more to give. I'm exhausted. I, I, I'm used up and I don't have any more. You, you've just, you've drained it all out of me. That's it. And I went and sat down and I I, I just I didn't have any more to go and I, I sat down and I think they shouted and praised God for another two hours that night and I finally ended up going home and going to bed 12.30 in the morning and I finally ended up going to bed and there were still folks that were around a couple that were drunk in the spirit and they were still uh, uh, there and, and, uh, and ready to praise the Lord and just didn't want to go home and I thought I've got a 4 or 5.20 flight in the morning and I've got to catch out of here and I've got to go lay down at least for a few hours anyway and I I went to bed at 12.30. I was up a little after 3 o'clock in the morning. But I, I'm just telling you that, that there are folks out there that are mighty, mighty hungry. And you and I don't ever need to take for granted that what we've got is going to always be here. No, sir. Unless we're willing to do some things to maintain it and build it, we must understand we will lose it. We have got to do the things that God's called us to do in order to keep what God has given us. And I'm not interested in losing in one inch of ground. I'm not interested in giving up one ounce of space to the devil. I want to keep everything we've got and I want to extend my reach and see if I can bring in some more. Hallelujah. So that God can be praised and the church of Jesus Christ can be built. I got home Monday afternoon around 3 o'clock and the minister called me. He'd been in the service Friday night. Called me to let me know why he wasn't there Saturday night. He'd had to work and hated missing the service. But he called me to share with me how much he had really appreciated uh, of the message and just how the Lord had moved and ministered. But he, he talked about the service they'd had Sunday and how that the Lord had blessed them at their church. And he said how God had begun to impress upon him. He said, you know, I just really realized how much I've got to maintain me. He was a, a pastor and he said, how much I've got to keep me going. And uh, if I I don't keep me going. I'm not going to be able to reach out and touch others. And he just shared personal things in his life of how he felt that he had kind of failed and how he had kind of, uh, uh, you know, just not really kept up like he needed to kept, uh, keep up. And therefore, he was not having the effect. And sometimes uh, that flesh would just be able to resurrect and rise up and things would happen so that it would hinder his influence and his uh, effectiveness. And, and he realized how much he needed to keep up. And I said, I can, he said, you know, you go and I, I went and I preach and I still feel the anointing and the power of God. But, but I just realized that how I've got to still work on my life and how I've got to keep my soul in tune. And I said, I'm going to tell you something, young man. I remember in those earlier days of my ministry, there was times that, you know, I had times and periods that I went through. You go to church, you could preach and, and the power of God would be there. But it just you would go from days in which you just didn't, you didn't get the amount of prayer in that you really wanted to get in. You didn't get the study time and that you'd go and God was gracious and you'd put a few hours in the study and God was gracious and give you a message. I said, you're going to find out something, young man. The closer you get to God, the less you ever be able to do that. And I shared with him, I said, I, I can't go that way anymore. It takes more prayer to maintain me now than it did 20 years ago. It takes a greater closeness to maintain my life and my ministry now than it did when I began in this thing 26 years ago, the closer you get to God, you'll not do less, you'll do more. You don't get close enough to God uh, where you can coast on in. Uh, the closer you get to God, uh, the more you'll dig in. Uh, the more you'll get a tighter grip. Uh, the more you'll get serious about your life. If you're uh, a person that you can go days and, and you can go weeks and not really worry about a move of God, I'm going to tell you something, you're in a heap of trouble, my friend, uh, because you and I have got a life to maintain. Uh, we've got a state to maintain. Uh, we got a condition and a relationship to maintain. Wherefore, let him that think of the stand to take heed, lest he fall. Right. Amen. True. I turned on the television the other evening, and curiosity got the best of me, and I saw the caption. Classic Jimmy Swaggart Crusades. Classic Crusades. 
And I wondered what that was and I, I flipped it on. And they were showing a crusade and I want to say it was Portland, Oregon, 1982. I looked at my girls and said, girls, that's when I graduated from high school. 1982, massive crowds. The look on his face was much different then. People coming. People all over the place coming to hear this man in Portland, Oregon. From all of the country. But I watched this. His wife got up and I watched the less than modest appearance and less than shamefacedness and the appearance, a worldly appearance, a very worldly appearance. And I told my girls, I said, holiness men rejected that long before it ever fell. Holiness men looked at that and saw what was coming. You can't play around with the world. That was 1982. I said, I can't remember exactly when it was. I know my wife and I were married. We got married in 1985. And I remember it was sometime after that, not long, maybe a year, two years at most. So it was in, this was about five years before this man fell. And I'm sure there were many people sitting in the crowd that day that thought, it'll always be this way. We're gathering momentum. We're going to reach people. We're going to touch people around the world. The broadcast was going all over the world. And here was at least a Pentecostal man that at least did act like he had some sense, although there were some issues that we did not agree with him on. And there with some worldliness that we saw that it already was creeping in. But those seeds that were sown begin to take root and take a hold. And before you know it, I tell you what happens. Somewhere a man thinks she can get in that pulpit without prayer. Somewhere a man thinks she can get up there and it becomes performance rather than the power of God. He begins to rely on his ability and his talent. And I listened to it and I said in 1982, I probably didn't see it then, but as I'm looking back, I said, girls, it's as dead as four o'clock. It's just as dead as dead can be. The seeds had already been sown. It may take you a little while. You may not happen to you right now. You're coasting along. You're not digging in. You're not reading. You're not committing the Word to memory. You're not drawing near to Jesus Christ. You'll get along for a while and you'll coast. But the day will come when the devil's got that trap that's laid for you and that trap will be sprung and you're going to fall into it because you're not able to resist once you pray that you enter not into temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we come to that place, we trust the flesh, we trust our ability, we think we can stand. We're like Peter, we got it together. I'll not deny you, Lord. I know my convictions, brother words. I'll never go back. Wherefore, let a man think he standeth, take heed lest he fall. I've turned on a few times Jimmy Swaggart's present ministry and never have I seen a man whose countenance shows more strain and stress than it does now. There's no joy, there's no life, there's no power, and there's no holiness. The rhetoric is there. If you listen to the message, they're still talking about some things in reference to holy living and some things in reference to moral living. But the power's gone, my friend. The power's already gone. I'm just here to tell you tonight that you and I need to make certain we understand that we will, there is no unconditional guarantee that we're always going to have what we have tonight unless we are careful to maintain it and keep it gone. I want to just talk about three things God laid in my heart. Number one, that you and I have got to maintain and keep, and this is one. We have got to maintain an atmosphere where the Spirit of God can have complete liberty in the midst of us. If we ever get to the place that we want to clamp down the working of the Spirit, 
We ever get to the place that we want to take the control and wrestle that control out of the hands of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Then our fate has become doomed and sealed. If we ever get to the place that the leadership of this church thinks that we're the ones that are really in control of the services, then let it be known that we've missed it and we're gone. Because I'm telling you, we've got to let the master of ceremonies, the Holy Ghost, has got to grip every saint of God in this place so that each of us can have a sense. We don't want to, we're not just a bunch of people that are following a man in the pulpit. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is the head of every man and woman, every saint that's in this place. And you and I have got to have a sensitivity so that we move forward as one body. We do have some leaders in worship. We have some men that God may place in the leadership so that they may lead. But let it be known that the people sense where we're going. And as the pastors lead and direct, it might be sometimes through the song leader. And he's up here. But let it be that we all sense the direction the Holy Ghost has gone. And we're not too lax to get on board and say, go on Holy Ghost and do what you want to do tonight. If we ever want to formalize it, if we ever want to make it just ceremony and routine, and we take away the spontaneity of the Holy Ghost, you and I have lost out and we will lose what we've got in this place tonight. We've got to maintain an atmosphere where he has the liberty to convict people of sin. We ever want to try to cover up sin, we're missing it. We've got to have an atmosphere when, when sin walks into this midst, the Holy Ghost has full sway to expose it and judge it and condemn it and bring it unto repentance. Amen. Hallelujah. We've got to have an atmosphere where the gifts of the Spirit are expected, desired, and vessels are prepared so that the Holy Ghost can use them and we can expect that we can have prophecy and tongues and interpretation. A word of knowledge can come from God to reveal a situation in the church. A word of wisdom can come to address a particular need. There can be a miracle among us. I'm telling you, prayers have been answered in this place of late and I don't want to take that for granted. I want to let God have His way and I just want to make myself available and keep myself in tune with God so when the Holy Ghost wants to manifest Himself, He's got a vessel of clay and a sanctified and meat for the Master's use so He can be manifest in my vessel if He so chooses. We've got to have a place where he's got the liberty to bring forth the word of truth from this pulpit. If we ever get where we want to clamp down the preaching, where we want to say, just preach it this way, Brother Woods. Just take it down this way, Brother Doug. Well, that subject's not good. My, uh, my uh, Brother Emery, I was on the phone with him. I believe it was yesterday. He visited a church. I asked him to visit in West Virginia. And the minister told him, uh, uh, spoke to him and said this to him. He said, uh, because Brother Emery had looked around the church and there was a lot of worldliness. But this man lived holiness in reference to externals uh, and, and his wife as well. Uh, but in the congregation, there's sure short skirts and there's just basically in like you say at Walmart, no difference in what you see there. And uh, he said to him and, and spoke to him I, I guess they must have had a, some exchange of words about it. And he said, I don't preach that. I just let the Spirit of God deal with it. I don't preach that. Let me tell you something. The Spirit of God deals with things uh, through the preaching of this Word. That's one of the ways. If it's in that book, it ought to be preached. Uh, this book is inspired by the Spirit and inspired by God. Uh, and we we don't need to think uh, that we can take certain portions that may be uncomfortable for us uh, and may remind us of even what we were. Oh, Brother Woods, that's a sensitive issue. Stay away from it. I'm telling you, I'm not here to worry about whether it's sensitive or not. If it's the Word of God, we need to keep an atmosphere that says, Preach on, Brother Woods. Preach on, Brother Doug. Preach on, Brother Emery. Because we want the truth. Uh, if it hurts us, then we just want to move on up. If it's like a hammer, then let it break our heart, heart to pieces. Let it come like a sword and pierce to the divide and asunder of the soul and spirit so that we can be spiritual men whose senses are exercised in the Word of God. We've got to maintain an atmosphere where the Spirit has the liberty and there is a worship. Like tonight, we've spent some time just worshiping God. 
Amen. I appreciate something in this church. I'm not really sure how it evolved. It hasn't always been that way. I don't really remember when the change has been made. And I'm not... And I want want you to hear me out on what I'm about to say. But among Pentecostal holiness people, there is a uniqueness. At least for the ones I've been exposed to, there is a uniqueness about this church in terms of our times of worship and, and altar services and when we're praying and praising God. Much of it goes on without the aid of music. Now, I'm not saying there's not going to be times we don't have someone on that pen to play and let God lead. I'm not going to tell you there's not times we don't have, we're not up here, we're singing and praising God and the instruments are, 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 are being used and we're praising Him on the ten strings instruments and we're praising Him with the timbrel and the harp. Nothing wrong with that. And we're not going to do away with that because it's biblical and it's alright. But I'm telling you, there are many places it's become a crutch and people can't worship God, they can't pray, and they can't seek God. God, unless there's some music going on and they become dependent on that. I don't want this church to depend to, dependent upon anything but the Holy Ghost of God. Hallelujah. All it takes for us to ever worship are hearts that are sincere and right with God and my spirit connected with the Holy Ghost. Your spirit's connected with the Holy Ghost and we can worship God whether it's day or night. We don't have to have a guitar or a piano and we don't want to develop a crutch where we lean on it. We want the Holy Ghost to have liberty so that He knows He's the only one we need to further our worship. I appreciate that. I've been in many churches that they just struggle that if someone's not on that piano singing, they can't pray. I'm not saying that to criticize them. I'm just saying it. We've got to maintain that. We've got to make certain that our focus is on the Lord. The second thing that you and I have got to do is we've got to maintain and continuously desire the power of God in order for us to be faithful. I'm telling you, I can't make it by myself. I'm finding more and more I can't get one step in front of another. I'll stutter. I'll fail. I get to that pulpit. I need Holy Ghost more than I've ever needed Him. I'm telling you this last weekend, I felt my weakness so much. I'm going in and I'm thinking, Lord, I need you more than ever. He never failed me. I'm telling you, He never failed me and He'll never fail us as long as we're dependent on Him and let Him know it is your power that we want. We have no confidence in the flesh, but we have confidence only in the power of Almighty God. We've got to have power in order to live, in order to work, in order to minister. There's a world out there that's bound up in death and darkness and the only way they're ever going to escape it is the might and the power of Almighty God and it's got to be flowing in us. We need the power to be faithful to the truth. You hear me. We are in a time in which holiness preaching is out of season. The Lord says be instant or be ready in season and out of season. We're in a time in which it's out of season. That is, it's inconvenient and it's not popular. We're there. There have been times in which holiness preaching has actually been in season. There's been times when men can just preach and the power of God fell and people were just swept into the church and the power of God saved men and women almost by the tens and hundreds. They were swept in and it was a time that it was in season. We're in a time when it's out of season and we are going to be tempted to somewhere compromise the truth and to just let up on a little bit of here or let up a little bit here. I'm asking you to help me me to pray and seek God to keep the power of God burning in our hearts that we are faithful to truth that we preach it we don't let it up and whatever we got to change in order to adapt our life to it in order to yield to the demands of it we will not let go because truth is necessary in order to be saved we need power to be faithful to our Lord there's a lot of things that pull out there 
in competition with our love for Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things that will grapple for your time. They'll grapple for your energy. They'll cling to you for your affection and your devotion. And you and I need a power to be able to push aside those tentacles and that octopus of this world and to push it aside and say, you're not going to latch on to me. I love Jesus and He's first in my life and I'm going to live for Him first and foremost. I'm going to keep a fire burning and every time I hear His Word, it burns in my heart like a fire and my heart is warmed with the presence of the Spirit of the living God. And I will ask God to give me an increase of hunger and increase my stamina to hear and maintain the Word of God. I looked at those folks and I thought, Lord, help us. We need help, Lord, because we don't have very much stamina. And I listen as folks were hungry and were hanging on every word. I'm telling you something. If what you had in this church was taken from you for a while, you'd be so glad to get it back like you've never known before. I don't think that has to happen. And God does doesn't want that to happen. He doesn't want us to have to go without it. He wants to pour it on every day. But we've got to know from whence our help comes. And that without God we can do nothing. Amen. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed. Right. Lest he fall. We're going to need power to be faithful to one another. Our relationships are going to be tried. The accuser of the brethren's working overtime. Our love is going to be tested. And we're going to be tempted to dis, uh, to, uh, um disapprove of one another or rather to be not forbearing with one another and not care for one another like we ought to and love one another and be patient with one another. We're going to be tempted to get short and, and to cut folks off and, uh, and to just uh, push this uh, our, our fellow brothers aside. I'm telling you, this world will put some pressure on you, my friend. Uh, this world will put you in a hot box when everything's coming down on you all at once. Uh, and all of a sudden, while it's all raining down around you, your brother uh, is in need and you've got to reach out to Him, but you can't do it because you're under such pressure over here. You can do it, I say that, but you're tempted to not do it. You're tempted just to reach out and push Him aside. No, sir, we need power. And when everything's raining in around us, we can still stand firm and tall and say, I'm going to be faithful to God, and I'm going to minister to the saints, and I'm going to love my brother, and I'm going to believe the best for them. Amen. Amen. We've got to be faithful to the work and we need power to be faithful to the work. I am, as much as possible, I am working to turn things over in this church that I've been doing to others and asking them to serve. You need to serve in this body. I haven't done it because I've been selfish. I did it because it was there. And at the time, I was the one available to do it. But now God wants to extend. Now God wants the church to grow. And it means the load's got to be shared. Amen. And I'm working... In various areas as much as I can to find people who are qualified and, and ready to serve and labor in various ministries that are taking place in this church so that we can work and reach out together. Because it is not the work of one man. And if we ever get to the place we think it is the work of one man, we'll lose it. This church hasn't been built by one man except by the one man Jesus and it will not be maintained by one man. There are many people that on a daily basis that are sacrificing, that are laboring, that are giving. There are prayers being offered up for people in this church that you never see. They go unnoticed. There are people that are on their knees and praying and are crying out. There are visits that are being made that you never see. You have nothing to know about it. But things are happening and things are being done on a daily basis. Don't you ever sit back in this church and criticize because you think not enough's being done. You just ask yourself, how much are you doing? That's all you need to be concerned about. What are you doing? Are you doing your part? Are you being what you need to be in this church? Because if we're not maintaining it, and if we don't have the power of God, we'll be unfaithful to the work, and if we don't maintain it, we'll lose it. I came back with seven new names for the CD of the month. That number's already went to 76 now every month. 
It's going to grow, church. But we're going to have to be faithful to maintain it. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not telling you. I'm just telling, trying to tell you what is happening. But this man that has been emailing me from the Philippines, he keeps emailing me. I keep answering him. I have sent him now several outlines. He has nothing to begin with. He is now teaching from our outline on the Trinity in the Philippines, passing it out among the pastors. Several outlines that I've already sent to him. He said, I don't have anything. I need help. If God sends them our way, what are we going to do? Are we going to shut the door and say no? Are we going to say it's not? I'm just trying to take it one day at a time. I have no idea what's going to go there. I have no idea what's going to take place. All I know is God's able to do what God's going to do. God may call a young man in this church and raise him up and send him to the Philippines to work and labor there. I have no idea. All I know is this. Let's just do and be faithful what God opens up to us when He brings it. And let's go forward. We've got next Next month, two of the elders of this church are going to Mexico. And I thank you. Brother Doug said some offerings coming in. And I thank you for that. I appreciate your generosity and your giving. And you will share in the reward. I promise you that. And there are ministers there that are waiting. There are people there that are hungry. There are people that are thirsty for the Word of God. God has not blessed this church for us to hoard it up and say, we're just going to be selfish and maintain it. You show me a church unwilling to reach out and share what they have. And I'll show you a church and God will cut off their source and they'll dry up like a prune. Wherefore let a man think if he stand, take heed lest he fall. God has always used a people who have been willing to be channels for Him. But when they cease to be a channel, God will cut off their source. Have you noticed not a bills went unpaid. Financial reports presented to the men of this church every quarter. I normally post them on the back board. I didn't do it this time. Sorry. But every three months you can see the financial report. Not a bill's been unpaid. God's blessed us to give. All of our men are working. That's not by chance. That's by the grace of God. And as long as the men of this church continue to be generous and give... God will continue to bless the men of this church. How many of you believe that? I believe that the blessing on the men of this church is because of their willingness to give and to give liberally to the work of God. I'm telling you, there are folks being fed in Africa. Or thinking, and in anything we are, all we can do is be a channel and nothing more. All we can do is receive from the hand of God and put it in somebody else's hand. We can't count any effort on our part to say, look what I've done, look what I've gathered, look what I've accomplished. No, there's a sermon preacher touches somebody all we can say is thank you Jesus if there's a CD goes out and blesses somebody if there's somebody that's blessed in the ministry of this church all we can say is hallelujah praise the Lord for letting us share in the wonderful work of God and finally we need to labor we need liberty we need power And we need to labor. Sinners need to be saved. We're hoping to get ready to go into the area on Clark's Neck Road and begin to witness and knock on doors. There are contexts that are coming to us that we're trying to get up with and and reach out to people. But we need conviction. We need conviction. Let's not expect God to convict sinners if we're not convicted. Amen? Let's not ask God to convict sinners and to see marvelous transformations of people where they come out of nothing and they're just all of a sudden they're burnt up with a love for Jesus and hunger for Him. If they don't see that in us, let's not ask God to put it in somebody else. If our lives are haphazard, if there's sin in our life, let's not ask God to reach out to those that are in the bondages out in this world. 
We've got to live under the conviction of the Holy Ghost. We've got to live under the power of the Spirit so that this world knows we're convinced that Jesus is Lord and He's guide in our life. We're convinced that sin is wrong and we're shunning it in every way that we know how. We're convinced that God has come to judge this world and that God has made a way that men can be free from the power of sin. As the sister said it tonight, I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I once was lost and now I'm found. I once was a sinner but now I'm saved. It's a contradiction of terms and language to talk about being a sinner and talk about being saved out of the same breath. It just doesn't work my friend. You're either a sinner and you're lost or you're a saint and you're saved. And you can't be both. And you can't have half of one and half of the other. Somewhere we've got to understand that that's where you and I are at tonight. And it's not going to happen out there if it's not present in here. Amen. You want people to fall in love with Jesus? You fall in love with Amen. Jesus. Amen. You want a sinner to be convicted of the power of God? Get the power of God in your life. Yeah. Amen? We need conviction. But we need more than conviction. We've had conviction in this church. And we've had people run out the door under the heat of it. But I don't just want conviction, I want conversion. I want them to convert. I don't want them to run from it. I want them to run to it. So somehow we need the heat turned up some more. The cross has got to become more attractive. And we need God to anoint by the Holy Ghost and make this church a flame that when the world steps into the doors of a worship service, that they can see a body of people who are in love with Jesus and just caught up with Him. They're not putting on airs. They're not a showboat. They're not a social club. They're just a bunch of common folks in love with God. And I'm telling you, that'll be such a stark contrast to this world. It'll be an attraction under them. The simplicity of our lives, the simplicity of our dress can once again be an attraction if it's linked with the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Oh yeah. But we don't only need conviction and conversion, we need integration. What do I mean by Integration. It'll do no good for us to see people saved if we're not willing to make them part of the family. Somebody's got to take them home. Somebody's got to invite them over for supper. Somebody's got to befriend them. Somebody's got to make them feel welcome beyond the church service. Many in this building have known each other for so long We worship, we do much together. During the week we see one another, we do things together. I'm telling you, there can't be one sinner that's saved and added to this church that you and I do not reach out to them and work to integrate them in this family so that they feel and know they're a part of this family wherever they come from, that we love them and we want to work with them and integrate them so that they feel that they are a part of who we are. And we don't have big eyes and little U's around here. We don't have clickish groups we don't have the in group and the out group we're all one big family we're all brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ and once they get them integrated we need them discipled and taught the word of the living God somebody has got to be willing to help them beyond the pulpit and to reach out and touch them beyond the pastor well brother Woods I thought that was the pastor's work then you've got a wrong concept of biblical ministry my friend I'm telling you discipleship involves everybody that's in this place and we are one family under the Lord Jesus Christ and we've all got a part to do in helping people grow in Christ Jesus. Well, that's the preacher's job to do all the visiting. He's got to go here and he's got to go there. That's a mentality you need to throw in the garbage can. The preacher's doing all that. There'll be no praying, there'll be no studying, and there'll be no seeking and the church will soon die. And that's why a lot of churches are dying. Come on, brother. Amen? Yeah. Because they place more emphasis on just that one man making his circuit or two men or whatever it is instead of everybody laboring and working together yeah. so that it allows each person 
to give the full time to what they're best at doing. Amen? Yes. Understand the pastors of this church care. We're going to do our share to visit and to reach out. Matter of fact, most of the folks that's been won in this church have been won by the pastors. Amen? I'm not saying all, I'm saying most. But the fact is, is that we can do more with that. You and I can grow with that. We can work with that. And there are folks in this church that have won others. There are folks sitting here tonight. You've brought someone to church. You're responsible. You've brought them in. You've helped them win them. And you've befriended them. And you've helped to disciple them. That's what we need. And it needs to grow. It needs to be something that can be built. We've got to maintain it, church. If we don't, we will lose it. I didn't come to throw water on your fire. I just came to tell you that let us never think we got to the place that we can coast along and Everything's all right. No, Brother Woods is going to tighten the screws every time he gets a chance because I don't ever want you to get to the place you think we got it all together. We're home free. We're not home free until the rapture takes place, my friend. We're not home free until our feet step on the streets of glory and we're in the presence of Almighty God. And until that day arrives, we've got to maintain and work and see that God's work is kept in our life. Hallelujah. I didn't say any of that to discourage you. God knows I don't want to do that. I just want to stir you up. Don't you come in here Sunday morning, having coasted from Wednesday to Sunday, and expect to move a God Sunday. You've done nothing to pray in preparation for that move. You've not prepared your heart. You've not prepared your mind. You've not prepared your spirit. You've not prepared your soul. And you've wasted your time and squandered it. You've been involved in too many things. And Sunday morning rolls around. You'll get by like that for a while, but after a while, you'll lose it. Wherefore, let a man think of his stand and take heed, lest he fall. I'm going to tell you something tonight. That was not the verse I had intended to preach. I just had some thoughts God laid in my heart, but while we were worshiping, God spoke to me. That's where it's at. Because God's saying to this church that He loves us. He cares for us. He has blessed us more than we're worthy of. He has been good to this church. You've got good men in this church. We've got good people who love God. We've got a good family. We've got harmony. We've got unity. We've got love among the brethren. But I'm telling you, let's not take it for granted and let's not think that there's an unconditional guarantee that we can always have it. Let's make sure we're working to keep it. Amen? How many will commit to doing that tonight? And will say, Brother Woods, I'm going to be a little bit sharper about, come on. Is that all I got? One or two? How many are going to be honest? In other words, I'm going to be a little bit sharper to make sure I'm watching. I'm a part of this flock. I'm a vital part of this flock. You're here tonight. I don't care if you're five years old. You are vital to the ministry of this church. Amen? If you're five, if you're 105, we need everyone to be faithful and to be doing all that you can do to build the church of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Would you stand to your feet? I want us to pray.